So I, I moved to LA in the 80s and listened to KROQ and danced in nightclubs. So these guys were totally part of my world this whole time. Um, Edgar, when did you first find them? What, 79-ish? Yeah, like I say in the film, um, it was watching uh, Top of the Pops uh, during the kind of Georgia Moroder phase. And I, um, I watched Top of the Pops from a very young age. And I, re I remember just being sort of very, <laughs> very struck by the fact that um, I felt like when Ron and Russell were like sort of that they were looking directly at me and I felt like I was in trouble, <laughs> you know, <laughs> watching them on TV. So it was just very sort of diverting, like even, even as a five-year-old sort of under like just knowing that there was something about the stagecraft that was just different, that, you know, especially like sandwiched between like, you know, ABBA and, uh, uh, you know, something else where it was all smiles. So I, at first it was just kind of like the, the image of Ron and Russell. And then sort of my parents used to buy me and my brother these, those, I um, remember like the Ronco, k yeah. ten aside like <laughs> compilation albums. So I had two of those that happened to have two Sparks tracks on them. So then at a very early age, it was like I had Beat the Clock and I had When I'm With You and just, just listened to them again and again. And then I think, you know, maybe this comes across in the documentary is that <clears throat> in a sort of pre-internet age where you didn't have everybody's discography at your uh, fingertips for free um, or like you couldn't look up everything on Wikipedia Im immediately, you sort of had to let the music come to you. And so with Sparks, it would be something that Sparks just kept coming back into my life. Like um, either like just hearing a random song or then especially in the mid 90s when Ron and Russell had When Do I Get to Sing My Way in the UK, which was like a hit and like the video is everywhere. That I just, they just kind of kept becoming more and more of a presence in my life. And uh, I, I guess the sort of point where, um, I mean the point where I, I, I decided to sort of do the documentary was I, t I, got to, I got to meet Ron and Russell in Los Angeles um, through Twitter. I mean, this is what bizarre is that I sort of like... <laughs> you and I tweeted at each other once and sitting next to each other in a restaurant. <laughs> well, the thing is, I, I, having been a fan for years, I sort of maybe assumed that they were too enigmatic to be on Twitter. And then when I looked at their, their Twitter page, it said, Sparks follows you. <laughs> and so I messaged and said, is this actually the band? And Russell replied and said, yeah, this is Russell. And I was like, oh my God, I'm such a huge fan. And, we sort of had coffee like 48 hours later. And then I think, uh, th then maybe like a couple of years after that, I had seen Ron Russell live a couple of times um, in LA like the, with the Franz Ferdinand tour, the FFS. And then around this time as well, as after I'd finished doing Baby Driver, I started, I didn't plan, making a documentary wasn't necessarily on my bucket list of things to do, but I am a huge fan of documentaries and particularly of music documentaries. And I had started to say to friends, why hasn't somebody done a documentary about Sparks? Oh, why? Sparks makes such a great documentary. I've seen so many music documentaries about bands that are tenth as influential as Sparks. <laughs> and it was at a Sparks gig in 2017. I was with the director, Phil Lord, and we were standing in the balcony before, and I was giving the same spiel about somebody should make a feature documentary about Sparks. The, you know, the only thing stopping them from being as, as, as lauded as they should be is like an overview. And Phil Lord said, you should do the documentary about Sparks. <laughs> And I said, OK, I will. And then I mentioned it to them that night. And what did you guys think? Oh, we, we said it's, that's a, ver a verbal contract. So you're, <laughs> you're now stuck with us. No, we, it, we really were resisting the need for uh, a documentary. You know, we've had other people approach us. And there, you know, there's kind of a sense of a documentary in a general sense about a band being kind of the obituary, if not like a true obituary, then just a creative obituary that you're being kind of seen in the uh, past tense. And so we, you know, we always resisted, but, uh, you know, we, we were always, we were aware of Edgar's films long before we, we, uh, we met him. And then, you know, he, he came to us and, and just his feelings, you know, whatever anybody feels is the, is the truth or not the truth, but he, he felt that what we were doing at the present time was was as valid and, and strong musically as what we'd done in the past. And so it didn't take a lot of arm twisting for us to to say uh, to say yes immediately. 
So Edgar, you must have figured out the narrative going in that it was about their extraordinary drive and professionalism and creativity, that they just never stopped. Yeah, I mean, that was something I, I was aware of going in, but like it was, I sort of knew that going in because I just was, I think it was part of the thing that was just kind of confounding to me and I just found so inspiring was that like the, especially, you know, to sort of see them kind of like keep raising the bar for themselves and sort of pushing forward. And it's that thing in a way that kind of like, so sort of whether, you know, like sort of just sort of continuing forward uh, thinking about market forces and stuff, it just leaves such an amazing sort of like body of work where like they've just done, you know, kind of stuck to their guts all the way through. So I was really aware of that. And I think in then in talking, the thing as well, I sort of realized that it had to be an oral history and that's partly because these two are too modest to say things <laughs> about themselves that other people could say for them. But the range of people that you collected, I want to know how you did that. Talk about the process of collecting <laughs> all the talking heads. That was, that was his, his uh, job, his doing. Seriously. No, uh, uh, Edgar has a much bigger Rolodex than, yeah. than we do. We, and so. we don't know anybody. So <laughs> it, it, and it made it, you know, one of the reasons why we felt so comfortable doing the documentary was, you know, it was that very idea that we didn't have to kind of uh, explain ourselves or justify ourselves, that it was other people and, and people that were really from all different areas, not, not only different areas musically, which, you know, were really, you know, it was really uh, heartwarming for us to hear people in different musical styles that were friends of Edgar or at least acquaintances and then but also people outside of music like Neil Neil Gaiman and and uh, and those sorts of people you know that it it just meant so much to me uh, to us uh, uh, always talking about me but uh, <laughs> it, it 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 meant so much to us to uh, to know that these people had been there all that time because we work in such a kind of an enclosed space and we don't really have much feedback as to what is happening, uh, the reaction to what we're doing. In terms of getting the interviewees, there were like three three sections to it. It's like people that Ron and Russell have worked with, which is obviously an amazing kind of illustrious kind of list, even just the producers like Todd Runger and Giorgio Morodo, Tony Visconti. Then there's people that have artists that have been on record as being fans, which included people like Duran Duran and Vince Clark. But then the wild card, and this was my doing, is that I just I I sort of guessed that people might be Sparks fans and four out of five times I was right. <laughs> so it would literally be like saying to Mike Myers saying, Hey you like Sparks, right? Oh my God, I love Sparks. <laughs> or like to Neil Gaiman, like you, you must be a Sparks fan. Oh my God, I'm a huge Sparks fan. So they, this is things that they didn't know about. And I was kind of like, sort of just kind of like went on a hunch about people. And more often than not, I was correct. So how did you set it up? You, you just invited people into a studio to talk to you uh, in front of, and you had them, what kind of camera setup was it? You had them staring right at the camera. Yeah, we, you know, like we, um, you know, kind of uh, to take a leaf out of Errol Morris's book, right. we had, you know, that. But basically, I think the thing with that was, well, so we did interviews in London, New York, and LA over like a, a number of different trips, you know, because obviously getting all of those people in the same place. I think we only went to New York once, so we were kind of very lucky to get everybody there in one hit. But then LA, I think we did two or three times, and London, like two or three times, and, and Russ, Ron and Russell did interviews with me in LA and London. So I think there's something like 80 like interviews in the movie. And because I, that's your narrative. I mean, that's your soundtrack. You've got them telling the story. Yeah, and also what's interesting is obviously, people, as with the band, like myself, is people come in at different times. And that, that in itself I found interesting, because it's not like, I mean, it's an interesting, that was another part of it where it was kind of something that I found interesting about Sparks is that, because I split time between London and LA, I and talked to kind of Sparks fans in different places. I was aware that there was like different movements. So, for example, you know, obviously in the UK, I mean, just recently, like I think in this kind of you know sort of since Little Beethoven, you've had like sort of a, a whole other kind of like sort of um, following. But prior to that, people would talk about the Island Years or the Georgia Moroder stuff or like you know like gratuitous sex and senseless violence. But then you come to LA and people are like, oh my God, angst in my Thanks pants. Yes, oh true. my God, in outer space. And it's kind of interesting because the K-Rock years didn't register in the UK. Mm. Like, I don't think you guys toured in, in the UK no, between no. like 
79 and 94? No, we, we, we uh, ignored it. I mean, so much was going on here, but it's a shame we didn't, we didn't do more in the UK at that time. It was just the kind of the circumstances of our erratic, uh, you know, our, our erratic, uh, you know, situation just around the world. Uh, it's like you, you could have this, this sound, you know, this like graph that would show you popping up in all, all these different places over time. You know, no, it's 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 really curious because the seventies there was like the you know the show in the movie um, you know there was a really wild period for us there and then then in the eighties the whole K rock time it was really wild here and then then the nineties it, it happened again in Germany and it's young young kids again discovering the band not knowing the band so it's always been this thing where um, the the band gets discovered by different uh, different people around the world at different times so it's really uh, confounding to us. <laughs> I'm still trying to imagine you hanging out with Jacques Tati, I have to say. <laughs> Talk about we did. this. <laughs> the only thing we, we regret, we have no regrets about the documentary. We think it's really beautiful what Edgar did. And they tried to unearth um, a really amazing TV show we did with Jacques Tati in, um, in Stockholm during the, um, I guess it was sort of the, the mid-70s. Mid and um, we were working with Tati on we, what we hoped and he had hoped would be his next film and it never came to be. He didn't do another movie, sadly, but it was gonna be a film called Confusion. And we were gonna be actors in that film with Tati. And so the Swedish, um, the Swedish uh, national television had invited him to come on with us to do um, just anything he wanted to do, just it was a some sort of variety show. And so we went on and he requested to have a, a white horse with him. And we said, okay, we'll go on with you and your white horse. And um, so we went on and he just kind of did what he does as like the Monsieur Yulo character, but with us and the white horse. And we just kind of winged it for, for 15 minutes. And unfortunately, uh, Edgar and his great team um, tried to unearth that footage, but it uh, it just doesn't exist. You found a lot of other good stuff, so that must have been fun. I mean, you must have an archive of your own that they were yeah. We kind of we we kind of pitched in as much as we could. We never were uh, pack rats, so we never threw away anything. Fortunately, so it finally came into for a, uh, had a good use. But uh, but Edgar has also a great team working in in London who uh, you know kind of trolled around the uh, the world, all the different TV stations everywhere that they could and found really great footage that hadn't been seen. Yeah, Kate Griffiths was the archive producer and, and when we put a kind of like, we put a word out on social media to ask fans for like footage or photographs and she said it was like the biggest response that she'd ever had for that, which was amazing. There's some amazing things as well, <laughs> like Russell's UCLA short film, Trey Sirius. Um, <laughs> When Très sérieux. Très sérieux, sorry. <laughs> when Russell sent that to me, how old were you when you directed that? Oh, what would I have been? Uh, eight, 18, 17, 18, yeah. So when 18. I was at art college and I was 18, I directed exactly the same show. <laughs> and I saw, I saw Russell's Très sérieux, so I was like, oh my God. And I said, Russell, I have to send you what I did when I was 18. It was basically exactly the same thing. It was a French New Wave spoof. And his was called Très sérieux. And Edgar, Edgar taught me, though, his title was Au bout de lemon souffle. <laughs> <laughs> but it was basically exactly the same film, so that was really trippy. So talk about some of the stuff you found, I mean, and stuff that you didn't, or maybe you hadn't seen in a long time that, that surprised you. Um, and and the, the music video period was very rich, so you had plenty of stuff to work with. Yeah, well, the, the one thing that was that is still there and was shown uh, briefly in the documentary was Island Records kind of had the foresight in the uh, the early 70s to even do something. It wasn't called a music video then because there were no outlets to show music videos. So they the one uh, clip they they encouraged us to do for this town in beginning for both of us, we kind of thought, why are we doing a you know this thing, a, a video with the song? Because we didn't even know where things like that would be shown, but they kind of, Chris Blackwell and, and all the people at Island had the foresight to kind of think that uh, there would be a use for combining, you know, a filming you doing your song. So that that video we're really happy uh, exists uh, in the in the documentary. It was such an outpouring of. I mean, there was things like that. I think the footage of you guys in Munich, 
like that I think the son of the TV director it had this film in the attic some 16 mil that like sent to us that, so that stuff is just you know and there's some TV clips that I sent to you that you couldn't remember shooting no there are a lot of <laughs> A lot of we we have a uh, amnesia now about <laughs> a lot of what happened. <laughs> it's, a, it's strange for us to see the documentary and see the different kind of, especially television contexts that we were put in, like housewife shows and cooking shows, and then kind of more intellectual shows. And some, you know, we 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 have to kind of. I don't, it's just strange that what you're doing is the same musically and and the way you are as far as your image, but the context of it is kind of seen differently by other people and um, it it it's bizarre where where you're seen you're seen in that many different ways how do you guys account for your equanimity you know the the fact that you didn't let this stuff get you down what what, what was in your character that enabled you to to be so stoic and and keep moving forward well i mean part of it is i mean i don't I mean, it, it's just, you know, lack of other options is <laughs> one, one, one thing. I mean, we, we kind of burned all the bridges to having uh, any kind of other sort of career. And so, and, you know, but we, we feel, I don't know, we, we feel that there's something that we're doing that isn't being done by other people and, and uh, in, a, in a way that, you know, trying to not be as arrogant about it as I, you know, could be, but just you want you want there to be music like what you're doing, and you there isn't somebody else doing that, and so, so you feel that there's kind of a almost a moral necessity for you to be to be to be doing that, and uh, you know, we it it isn't always enjoyment, but but we we there is a f fulfillment that we get out of doing it that we don't get from from much else and so um, you know what what seems like you know this great drive and everything I mean, we kind of don't see it that way we don't have meetings you know with pep talks and all that sort of thing I mean we just we just do it all the time because there there isn't anything else to do really one thing that we're really happy about with the that something that came across that Edgar did that we didn't, with the uh, documentary that we didn't really expect would be that there'd be kind of this subtext of um, of ambition and all of that, that, you know, it relates to Sparks, but then it it can be taken, even if you don't know Sparks, we, we think that what we, the feedback we've gotten so far with the movie has been that it's been really inspirational for a lot of, you know, young people and older people as well that just are in creative endeavors and kind of needed to have some support that what they were doing was the right thing, that in the end, the only thing that matters is your creative vision and if things work for you commercially or they don't work for you in, in that sort of way, that's in the end, that can't be the, uh, the guiding force. It kind of has to be that you really enjoy what you're doing and, and at the end of the day, you kind of know that you're right and you have at least your creative, um, you know, what you've done creatively to, you know, is the one tangible thing is you have that in the end. And that was something that Edgar really, um, somehow that, that came across so strongly. And when we did the documentary from the beginning, we, were, we never would have thought that there would be that sort of as a, um, you know, an extra element of the, of the documentary. We thought, oh, it's just a, it's about a band, you know, from start to, start to the, you know, to the current. But there were these other kind of themes that popped up that, that have been really, um, you know, it's really great and really uh, gotten such amazing feedback from people that just on that level too. Well, I saw you in Cannes with Annette. I mean, you've you've been very creative in a whole other realm, uh, doing this extraordinary opera with with Leos Carax, and that must have been an extraordinary experience and a, and a challenging one. Yeah, I mean, we we've, we've obviously you know you mentioned Jack Tati, and you know we've always you know in addition to doing Sparks discrete songs, you know, we just having a passion for film, we always wanted to, to, you know, channel our music also into film, not so much in a soundtrack kind of way, but, but actually shaping a film. And so there, there was the tattoo thing. And then we had, there was a, a period in the very late, the very early nineties where there was a, a 
a manga called My the Psychic Girl, and, and we were brought in to, to make that into a musical, and, and Tim Burton had been attached to it, and that didn't happen. So when, when it finally got to the point where, you know, we, we went to Cannes, we had met, we had, we, had, we had worked on another project called The Seduction of Ingmar Bergman, which we had attempted, you know, again, to, to have become a um, movie musical, and we were at Cannes trying to convince other people, and we were introduced to Leos Carax. And in, in any case, uh, you know, finally we we were able to uh, have a project that we had, had created that could be done as a movie musical that actually saw the light of day. And just, you know, we're such film geeks that, that to have it be the opening night film at Cannes, you know, was just this absolute dream. Uh, for us, and you know, it really, you know, you know, just really thrilling. I just want to say, on a purely selfish level, like it went, when I started making the documentary, and that hadn't been green lit, it had been in development, but it wasn't necessarily being made. And I was actually had pretty much finished filming, and it was shooting last night in Soho when I heard that Annette had been green lit. And I, as soon as I heard that, I said, we have to go to Brussels and shoot on the set of Annette. And I was just on a selfish level thinking, ah, oh, my B-plot now has a happy ending. Because <laughs> if, if it hadn't been made, it would have been a bummer. It's like, oh, and all of their film projects failed. <laughs> and then they, the Leos character thing didn't happen either. And I was like, oh, thank God. So I was, I was on a purely selfish level. I was very happy that Annette oh, came together. We were happy to have helped uh, <laughs> shape the, uh, the tone of the, of the documentary. And then you all had a big premiere last Last night you, we were attending the last night in Soho. Yeah, Edgar thing. has an At amazing new movie. Edgar has an amazing new movie. Uh, last night in Soho too. So, uh, without saying a whole lot, to, uh, everybody should see it. It's really, it's really uh, fun. Really, really great, great Wickedly film. Entertaining. My, worlds, my worlds collided last night because Anya Taylor Joy, the star of um, Last Night in Soho, was on the red carpet, and then I broke off doing her photos. Because she goes, oh my God, Sparks. <laughs> and it was, it was the most amazing thing. I've never seen her as starstruck by anybody before. She was like, like hell, she goes, it's Sparks. I said, I know. <laughs> like, oh and, and she ran over to you. I've got a photo of her running over to you to say hi. We were, we were shocked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From Jacques Tati to Anya Taylor-Joy. <laughs> but before we go, I, I, you did some amazing animation in this movie. A lot of different kinds of animation and, and very ambitious. Talk about that. Well, it sort of started with um, um, Joseph Wallace, who had done, who was the stop motion animator. He had done the video for Edith Piaf, Said It Better Than Me, which had Ron and Russell puppets. And I had seen this video and I had met Joseph actually at a, at a Sparks gig, the one that I shot. That was the first thing I did was shoot a whole concert. And have you seen like there's a Blu ray which has the entire concert as a feature on it, which is really fun. Um, so I, it was, obviously, there are some stories where there's no archive and they're great stories. So it was an idea that I went through with Joseph of like using different types of animation, claymation, stop motion, cutout animation. And then there was another uh, uh, brilliant animator, Greg McLeod, did the more sort of drawn stuff. And the, sort of the real gift is that just Ron and Russell in retelling anecdotes happened to paraphrase what other people are saying. So me and the editor, Paul True Arthur, kind of really zoned in on those bits. It's like any time they like paraphrase, like the great story about bringing out the food stamps at the grocery store, is that both of you did like the voices of the checkout lady and, and, the, and the voice on the tannoy. So it's kind of just like, you know, obvious. It's like, this is great because not only have you got a, a great story with no archive, but they're kind of like, you've got the lip sync as well. So that we had great. real fun doing that. So you pulled a couple of your old stalwarts in to do some voices. Oh yeah, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost play the voices of John Lennon and Ringo Starr. <laughs> but the funny thing about the Ringo Starr bit, I don't, not sure Nick is a, uh, so Simon watched the clip and did, cause he had to lip sync and Nick, I think was in, <laughs> so Nick, Ringo Starr just says Hitler. So the funniest thing about that was that I said to Nick, I said, hey, will you do the voice of Ringo Starr? And he goes, yeah, sure. And I said, what do I have to say? He said, just say Hitler, question mark. So then I got a voice memo back from him. And he was in LA and I was in London. And it's just the most surreal thing of just listening to Nick Frost say, Hitler? 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 And then, is that okay? <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, it was an amazing contribution to the movie. <laughs> 
Well, thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank and you. And thank you for the movie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Give it much. up for Sparks. Oh. And Edgar Wright. And Edgar Wright. <laughs>